Today is Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, and this is Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss, authors Victoria Grady, Patrick McCreesh, narrated or read by Alex, a corporate cowboy. Powered by Incorporating Associates, with some commentary. Published 2022, with some acknowledgments from Victoria Grady for David Kendall Regan, from Patrick McCreesh. For Courtney, Lizzie, Rose, Bridget, and Ginger. I'm assuming they're family and friends. You know, you know how that goes. Table of contents. First is the preface. Then the acknowledgments. Then the authors. Chapter one. Why do people get stuck? Chapter two. The brain's journey is our journey. Chapter three. Why do I get stuck? Chapter 4, How Do I Get Stuck? Chapter 5, What Do I Get Stuck To? Chapter 6, How Does Culture Get Stuck? Chapter 7, Is My Organization Stuck? Chapter 8, Leading a Stuck Organization. Chapter 9, Unsticking the Future. And then the Index. Here's the preface. Oh, then what I read before were dedications. Dedicated to, but not acknowledgements. Dedications, not acknowledgements. The preface. This is a book about the brain, the human experience, and how our life experiences shape our behavior at work. It's easy to say that we can divide work and life into two neat camps, but... We come to work with the same brain we use in the rest of our lives. Our brain is formed by memory, emotion, and learning into a powerful force that makes us who we are as people. It helps us create powerful solutions for problem solving and makes us resist even the simplest changes. This is when we get stuck. When life's evolution makes it hard for us to move forward, even though every rational piece of data says just move on. This book is a journey to understand why we get stuck and how leaders and organizations can use research to guide themselves, their teams, and their organizations in a deeply human and more effective way. The journey of this book started 20 years ago. More precisely, the research for this book started 20 years ago. However, that's not really where the journey started. Like everyone, our journey to understand the human experience started the day we were born. We got some woke ones. We both had challenges, both the authors. We both had challenges that led us to understand why people get stuck. There is both a personal story that guided our interest and a professional story that led us to this book. Victoria Grady's personal story of being stuck. I went to college and I did well. I got my master's degree and did okay. I got married after I finished my master's degree, then moved to Europe. We were ticking the boxes. Getting the European experience. I was teaching for University of Maryland's European division, and my husband was fulfilling his dream of practicing law with the 1st Infantry Division of the U.S. Army, the Big Red One. We were experiencing cultural diversity, learning new languages, and traveling the world. The first year took us to eight different countries. Then, 
After a short honeymoon, or at least it seemed short, my husband received what would prove to be a terminal cancer diagnosis. My entire world came to a screeching halt. It came to a halt because everything I thought to be the next steps, the next piece in the puzzle, the next part of the journey of life as I expected it to be had suddenly stopped. It stopped because my husband had been diagnosed with terminal illness. In one brief conversation, I lost my connection to everything I thought to be true, secure, or stable. Everything changed. The thought I struggled with the most, the thing that I kept thinking about was, wow, look how attached I was to my perception of what my life would or could be. What it, lo what it would look like. What it would look like. Throughout my life, I was completely attached to the concept that if you do X, Y, and Z, then of course A, B, and C are going to happen as a foregone conclusion. After my husband's initial diagnosis, I spent a great deal of time on self-reflection to better understand the role that my instinctual attachment to my previous life had on my ability to pivot, shift, and move forward. I was initially paralyzed by the disruption. My mental model was thrown into total chaos and it hindered my ability to engage when he needed me most. I was stuck. Patrick McCreesh's personal story of being stuck. I've always been good at keeping important commitments, especially commitments to the people who are close to me. My friend Joe was one of the people I most admired in the world. His carefree spirit was the personification of the duck, calm on the surface, but paddling furiously underneath the water. Joe worked hard at everything and, to me, was the American spirit. He grew up in, o o <laughs> he grew up in Oklahoma, played high school football, had eclectic music taste, and loved the open road. He was insanely well-read and came to the University of Virginia to study English. He went on to work as a paralegal and, despite my best efforts to convince him otherwise, Joe decided to go to law school. <laughs> Sounds like someone I know. We were living in Washington, D.C. after college when I made a commitment to Joe. There was a last-minute surprise concert by Bob Dylan at the iconic 930 Club in D.C. I got two tickets and Joe got zero. Of course, he was going to take the other ticket. But I forgot about Courtney. A month prior to the tickets even going on sale, my old friend Courtney told me she would be visiting from New York the same night as the Dylan concert. I called her nervously two nights before her visit to explain why I would now not be able to see her. I told her about the concert and she said, I love Bob Dylan. That sounds great. The I then called Joe. I told him what happened and explained that I didn't know what to do. I even suggested perhaps that he and Courtney go to the show. His response, like the duck, was calm and direct. She can go, but you have to marry her. She went to the show with me, and we have been married for 15 years now. I take my commitments seriously. Okay, I did not marry my wife because my friend told me so, but that night, did become our first date thanks to Joe. Over the next few years, Joe and I had a few adventures on the open road. We drove to Austin, Texas from Washington, D.C. and back over two weeks in search for the best barbecue. We made a few road trips for concerts. We got really into European soccer and recorded matches during the day to watch them after work. He was a groomsman in my wedding, and I helped him think about advancing his own romantic relationship. We also made long-term plans. I was going to pursue my PhD, and after he finished law school, plus working 
a few years in a big firm. Okay, I got that. I was going to pursue my PhD and after he finished law school, plus working a few years in a big firm, he was going to write travel novels. Two, two separate commitments. Two, indiv two independent, individual, personal commitments to uh, Joe and Patrick. Patrick and Joe. Two weeks after we celebrated my 30th birthday, Joe died in a metro accident. I still don't know what happened. It was in the middle of the World Cup, and we were joking about the matches via text while I was in New York and New Jersey. My apologies. While I was in New Jersey visiting family, the loss was terrible. Our whole group of friends from college drove from D.C. to Oklahoma City for the funeral in what felt like an extended funeral processional. A year after the accident, I decided to follow through on another commitment I made to Joe. I enrolled to get my PhD. It wasn't solely because of Joe, but to this day, I don't know how to separate the two things. I know when he died that I couldn't say I will get to it later anymore. I had to move on the important things right away. Joe became a symbol of a carpe diem spirit I think I always had, but somehow became intensified. It became intensified with a desire to complete things, to follow through on commitments. We had our second child the first semester of my doctoral program and the third before I finished. I worked full time in a consulting job and did classes at night before moving into the dissertation. It was hard. It was harder for my wife. There were no more Dylan concerts. At the worst points, I constantly thought to myself, why am I doing this? It seemed like I was not only focused on keeping commitments, but I was stuck on my commitments. Why was I so stuck on this idea of commitments? It seems deeply connected to Joe's memory. Joe became the reason to fulfill commitments that I make simply because I am here and I can. But why? Our personal stories led us both to seek research on how people react to situations of loss and change. As Victoria mentions, we were also seeing it in our professional lives. Both of us were working with technology consulting engagements where we saw people continue to struggle with the adoption of new technology, even when they understood exactly what the technology would do and even why they should use it, we would see them reject it completely. We both knew that something else was going on, and we had to understand what it was. Victoria Grady's professional interest in people getting stuck. 15 years ago, during my master's degree graduate studies, I was employed as a senior manager in the software training industry. Daily, I found myself perplexed by the intensely emotional response of individual employees from all types of organizations when new technology was introduced. Later in my career, I witnessed a similar reaction from individual employees impacted by change in management, leadership, and business processes as well. People were reacting emotionally to change in almost any organizational context, but I could know, I could, I could find no thread to understand the connection. To begin my investigation, I started taking notes and putting them in a folder under this title. Notes on common responses in individuals to different types of organizational change and the difficulties these responses present. These notes ended up spanning six years and two continents with observations from the southern, eastern, and northeastern United States and central and southern Germany. I recorded my conversations with exasperated employees in geographically, demographically, and culturally distinct areas and their reaction to change in technology, business processes, leadership, physical location, and structure. They all inadvertently identified an intense internal struggle in dealing with change. It wasn't that these individual employees were not good at change 
or that they hated change or that they were resistant to change. It was as if they were all dealing with an internal struggle that seemed inherent to the process of adjusting to change. And this internal struggle was not responding to external solutions. But why? In 2001, I gained additional insight into the answer. I, as I found myself sitting in an individual and group dynamics course at the George Washington University, Dr. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Dr. Jerry B. Harvey was present. <laughs> Let me start that one more time for you. In 2001, I gained some additional insight into the answer as I found myself sitting in an individual and group dynamics course at the George Washington University. Dr. Jerry B. Harvey was presenting a new concept he termed the anaclit, anaclit, anaclitic, anaclit, it, anaclitic, anaclitic depression blues, anaclitic, analytical, analytic, analytic. An anaclitic, maybe it's anaclitic, anaclitic depression. <laughs> Dr. Jerry B. Harvey was presenting a new concept he termed the anaclitic, anaclitic, yeah, depression blues, anaclitic depression blues. And he was in full control of my attention. His topic came from a chapter in his recently published book, How Come Every Time I Get Stabbed in the Back, my fingerprints are on the knife. <laughs> that's a funny ass. That's a funny ass title. That discussed the emotional responses of employees during periods of organizational downsizing. I mean, yeah, that's a pretty dramatic organizational change. At some moments during that lecture, I was hit by a bolt of lightning and I blurted out. You're saying that this emotional response relates to the type of change employees experience during a layoff. Interestingly, I have been listening to employees dealing with technology change, organizational structure change, leadership change, reporting status change, and process change since 1995. And they were all dealing with this blues thing too. Catching myself... As I became aware of the abruptness of my interruption, I changed the tone of my voice. Is it possible this type of depression is related to all types of change that it is really not just a resistance to the change, but so much deeper than that? His gaze was fixed on me with a probing intensity. But after that prolonged moment of uncharacteristic silence, Dr. Harvey calmly responded, Perhaps you have found a topic for your dissertation, Miss Grady. And not only that, considering the intensity of your apparent convictions, perhaps you have found a lifelong research path as well. Patrick McCreesh's professional interest in people getting stuck. My connection to the ideas behind stuck came at a conference. I was struggling with two problems simultaneously. My clients were stuck and I had too much data. I had been working with U.S. federal government clients for five years on change management programs around data and technology programs with little moderate success. While our direct clients loved our work, broad-based adoption of our solutions was always a challenge. I was struggling with a fundamental problem. Leaders said they wanted more data-driven decision-making in federal organizations, and most employees felt like they didn't understand why decisions were made. To me, the solution was simple. If we use data to drive decisions, both sides would be happy. But every time we built a new data tool, the average employee rejected it. At the same time, my team had collected a mass of data from U.S. federal employees on their attitudes and engagement on the workplace. The data included over 2 million survey responses a year over five years. I believed 
there was a connection between the between these two problems. I believe there was a connection between these two problems, but I was not sure what. I was at the Association of Change Management Professionals Global Conference, or that's ACMP Global Conference in 2014, where my colleague Tim Creasy introduced me to this woman, Victoria Grady. He told me she was a professor in the Washington, D.C. area, and I had to go see her presentation. I said I would. As I mentioned previously, I tried to keep my commitment to friends. Victoria's presentation had two key components. First, she explained the concept of attachment theory as why people had a negative biological reaction to change. Check. That solved one problem, I thought. Of course, people react negatively to new data tools. They know the data is better than their experience-based decision-making. That's not the point. It is new to them, and that creates a sense of fear. It is a change. Second, she described the framework behind the Change Diagnostic Index. That's discussed more in Chapter 6, which is a survey-driven approach to understand how organizations are reacting to attachment. Check. Now I know how to use the federal employee data in a meaningful way for our overall agenda to support usage and adoption of new tools. Victoria describes her reaction to Dr. Jerry Harvey as a lightning bolt striking. Well, lightning does strike the same place twice. It hit me too, and the two of us began a collaboration that has lasted more than seven years of shared research, writing, presenting, teaching, and consulting. More importantly, this research and the concepts behind Stuck form the backbone of how I think about strategy, organizational change, and digital transformation. I fucked that one up. Hold up. More, hold, hold up. More importantly, this research and the concepts behind Stuck form the backbone of how I think about strategy, organizational change, digital transformation, and yes, data analytics. We have collaborated since that ACMP conference on how to use the concepts in our joint research to create new insights for leaders and organizations. We have published several times, presented together, taught together, and collaborated on another, much more academic book. But in this book, our purpose is much different. We want to make our research practical. Well, I mean, which is why I picked this up. I don't, I don't want to be narrating an academic book for the podcast for free use. I mean, yeah, there are some, there are some uh, self-taught academics out there, but we're, we're, I'm trying to reach a practical audience and, I'm aware that our mission is the same. But in this book, our purpose is much different. We want to make our research practical. We want to make it so that anyone of any level in organ in an, we want to make it so that anyone of any level in any organization can use our research to improve their work life. We know how important and how hard it is to understand human behavior. And the goal is to provide you with some insights to make it a little easier. Being stuck is a human experience. We have both been stuck. Obstinate, obst, obstinate, obstinate. Yeah, I guess that's the word. Obstinate and we have both been stuck. Obstinate and unwilling to change for no foreseeable reason. We'll be stuck again as will all of you. This is a human experience that we study to understand, but it is not going to go away. Hopefully, you understand yourself, a coworker, a leader, or your organization a little better at the end of this book. More importantly, we hope you are inspired to help make yourself, a coworker, a leader, or your organization a little better based on something you read in this book. That's the end of the preface. I'm going, to go, I'm going to go ahead and knock out the acknowledgments right now and then a little bit about the authors. Acknowledgments. Many people contributed to this work over the years. 
We are blessed to have so many people interested in this topic and contribute their time and stories. Many researchers and students have provided ideas, articles, and analysis over the years to support this work. Some of the most recent contributors are Rachel Whitman, PhD from Auburn University, Reagan Gigant Narain, Jagat Narain, yeah, Jagat Narain. Reagan Jagat Narain, MBA from George Mason University. Thais Wilkins, MBA candidate from George Mason University. Mary Jo Coles, PhD student at George Mason University. And the exceptional Colin Dosdell from Notre Dame. Jagat Narain, 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 Jagat. Narain. Reagan, check out Narain. Or is it faster? Reagan, check out Narain. Depends. Some folk, some cultures say it faster. Some cultures say it slower. Enunciation. You know how that goes. Learning on the fly. Many colleagues have collaborated with us over the years to build on the ideas in this book. Again, a robust network of interested peers pushed on us to make the content and concepts we demonstrate here even stronger. First and foremost, James Grady, who has been a collaborator with Victoria for years and a collaborator with both of us on this book. His depth of research, understanding, and curiosity is inspiring. He brings so much passion and energy to his work. Tim Creasy of ProSci has always challenged us to take the extra step in logic and determine how to make the work more practical for the change management community. He is always willing to discuss any topic and test any idea. Ian Noakes provided critical contributions to the way that attachment styles evolve in the workplace and collaborated with us on our last book. We have also had access to two wonderful institutions that have helped us build these ideas over the years. The first is George Mason University, where Victoria is an associate professor and Patrick holds an adjunct position. The students at George Mason, George Mason, the students at George Mason University have been the testing ground of ideas for us both over the years and always provide excellent critical thinking and commentary on how to improve our concept. Additionally, the Association of Change Management Professionals, ACMP, has been an incubator of stuck. It is the place where we met. We first presented together at an ACMP conference. We collected many stories in this book at ACMP events. We charted our first book at a conference, and we continue to learn and grow through the organization. And then... There are our personal sources of support. For Victoria, that includes the Pivot Point team and the incredible DHG healthcare people and change team. That includes Scott Spawn, Lydia Haas, and Christy Rich. Christy Rich? Rich. For our ongoing partnership that is so instrumental in the practical application of the research. My infinite love to David, Kendall, and Reagan for the 10 plus years and countless hours I missed with you to finish the research that made this book possible. Damn, sounds like a pretty big sacrifice. Thank you to my inspirational parents, specifically my dad, James Grady, for his significant contributions to this work, and our wonderful grandmother, Mimi, who always believed in me. Finally, to Jerry B. Harvey, your 2001 challenge to learn to write, and the subsequent loss of my beloved David J. Goats in 2003 that were the basis of my inspiration for the research. For Patrick, this includes my symmetry team, that has worked with me and shown so much patience as we completed this book, including my partner, Wes Flores, Melissa Perez, and Victoria Velasquez, who all pick up the slack when I take on a new project. Thank you. Also, the incomparable Sarah Tiago, 
who helps me find solutions through any design and intellectual challenge and contributed to the structure and design of this book. And to my family, thank you for everything. My mother taught me what it means to never stop working and my late father's 42 year career as a leader showed me why people stick to organizations. He built the kind of teams people want to join and I can only hope to live up to the model he set. Thank you to my sister Erin for being a sounding board for the many challenges of work and life we face today. To my daughters, Lizzie, Rose, Bridget, and Ginger, thank you for sticking to me through this book. I know it hasn't always been easy, but your love, smiles, and snuggles instantly bring me back home after a busy day, week, or month. And to Courtney, my wife, thank you for everything you do for me and our family. You are the rock for us all. You make everything else possible. That's pretty neat. A little bit about the authors. Victoria M. Grady is the academic director at the MSM graduate of the MSM graduate program and associate professor of management organizational behavior in the School of Business at George Mason University. She also recently joined Dixon Hughes Goodman DHG based out of Charlotte, North Carolina as the professor in residence for their people and change practice. Victoria's research portfolio focuses on the behavioral implications of organizations introducing and implementing organizational change. Her unique emphasis is on the role of attachment behavior and transitional objects within the change process. Victoria's consulting practice includes work with United States federal government agencies, private and public healthcare organizations in the United States and United Kingdom, utility organizations in Australia, K through 12 and higher education institutions, nuclear power plants, and nonprofit associations. Recent research publications by Victoria can be found in Harvard Business Review, Washington Business Journal, Bloomberg News, GovExec.com, the Journal of Change Management, and the Public Manager. She is co-author of The Pivot Point, Success in Organizational Change of Morgan James Publishing 2013, co-author of Family Capital <laughs> co-author of Family Capitalism, Best Practices in Ownership and Leadership. Rutledge, that's publisher by Rutledge Gower Publishing 2017, and Attachment in the Workplace, Managing Beneath the Surface, publishing by Rutledge Taylor and Francis Publishing 2020. To learn more, please visit her website at www.pivotpnt.com. Follow her on her Twitter at 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 Pivot PNT or reach out via LinkedIn. She's on LinkedIn. We'll have to add her. Mr. Patrick McCreesh, PhD, is the managing partner of Symmetry, a strategy, analytics, and technology consultancy. Patrick is a visionary in analytics and change management who passionately leads teams to build data driven cultures. With 20 years of advisory experience, Patrick successfully leads teams through digital transformations and the development of analytics programs across the public sector and Fortune 500 clients. Patrick serves as, as adjunct faculty at Georgetown University and George Mason University Business School. Previously, he published the book Workplace Attachment. Managing Beneath the Service, that's a publishing by Rutledge, Taylor, and Francis, 2019, and has had publications featured in Bloomberg Government, the International Security Finance Monitor, and Public Manager. Patrick is also a leader in the global change management community through the Association of Change Management Professionals, ACMP. He founded and served as the president of ACMP DC, before serving on the ACMP Global Board of Directors. Patrick graduated from the University of Virginia with a Bachelor of Arts in Foreign Affairs and History 
received his Master of Public Policy from Harvard University and completed his doctorate in public policy at George Mason University. He lives in Northern Virginia with his wife, Courtney, and four daughters, Lizzie, Rose, Bridget, and Ginger. And that's the end of our preface, acknowledgments, and author section. Thank you. If you want to subscribe, keep this operation non-for-profit, you can do so on Patreon. It's the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram. It's at Corporate Cowboys with a Z. You'll see the profile. You'll recognize it. You can also shoot us a donation. There's a PayPal cash app, a Venmo floating around. That all goes towards business expenses and legal fees. Have yourself a blessed day.